Hi. Um, so this is the talk that I am giving that is do's and don'ts of CT guided biopsies at the Maharat Khan in Kalyan in December 2024. That's basically tomorrow. And I thought I'd put this up on YouTube so that during the talk, people can focus on what I'm saying and not take pictures and take short videos, uh, etc. So what do you do when you have a patient who comes for a biopsy? What do you do? So you have to protect yourself, protect the patient, hit the target and get answers. How do you protect yourself? You should do everything possible to reduce the risk of bleeding. Study the case and know what is to be biopsied. This is important. Make sure you have all the information required. You know what region is to be biopsied. Sometimes if there's a lung and a bone and a liver, figure out what is safer to biopsy. You know, node is safer. A bone is always the safest, then a lymph node, then a solid organ, etc. Be ready with everything needed to manage complications. Have the crash cart ready. Make sure you have your oxygen and other stuff required. Make sure your defib is working perfectly. Make sure your pneumothorax set is with you. Do a detailed consent and counseling, and I'll talk about this. And in a private setup, in a non-hospital setting, have a second hand like an anesthetist, someone who knows how to manage complications. Prevention of bleeding basically involves following guidelines. And so the INR should be less than 1.5, platelets greater than 100,000 in a standalone center, greater than 50,000 in a hospital. Stop clopidogrel and equivalents for five days. For the newer anticoagulants, find out what the safe period is and ask your hematologist friend if you're not sure. Most guidelines now say not to withhold aspirin, but I find that, you know, anecdotally, there is a problem with bleeding, uh, even, you know, with aspirin. And so I, I would like that off for five days. Patients who have CKD are at higher risk for bleeding and sometimes may have a normal INR, so be careful. Also remember that many anticoagulants are excreted through the kidney, so their half-life increases in CKD. So again, speak to the hematologist before you take these patients up. There is no data on tranexamic acid prophylaxis, but I have started using it, again, based on anecdotal evidence. So it's entirely up to you, especially when it comes to liver, lung, kidney, and spleen. <clears throat> Now, here's a patient who had come for a pancreatic head mass. I've used uh, an 18-gauge uh, gun here, and then suddenly the patient started bleeding after I withdrew the needle. And six minutes later, it's the same. So is there anything that you need to do? Well, most bleeding, and I think in the last uh, 20 years, so that's a long time, I haven't had catastrophic bleeding where a patient had to have any kind of procedure done. Um, so if you followed your coagulation rules, I think all bleeding stops on its own. In the last five years, we've started using IV tranexamic acid liberally whenever bleeding starts and obviously hospitalize if needed. Consent and counseling is extremely important. So explain the procedure to the patient and the relatives in detail. Explain the complications and how you will tackle them. Explain breathing patterns and be in touch with patients and relatives. And here's a simple URL where you can see I've, I've, I've taken a mock interview and consent and I've put it up. But you should do this. Protect the patient. Now, protecting the patient involves all the steps that we mentioned earlier, but you also need to manage complications and pain. Pneumothorax is, is what we need to reduce the chance of and then manage if it happens. So to reduce the chance of an entry pneumothorax, make sure it's a single puncture, angulate and traverse lung for immediately subpleural lesions. And I'll show you this. Avoid a transfissural approach as far as possible. Avoid going through cysts and bullae. To, uh, to avoid an exit pneumothorax, and remember an exit pneumothorax is the most common one, withdraw your needle slowly, do a rapid rollover, 
And many people use blood gel saline to seal the tract. I don't, but if you want to, and if you think it helps you, go ahead and do it. So this is what I meant by a subpleural lesion, where if you see here, this cannula can actually get into the pleural space. And then when you remove the stillet, air can gush in and you can get an entry pneumothorax, mainly because of air from outside. And so to prevent that, because it really creates an issue where you have to aspirate the air, etc., it's better to take a slightly oblique course in such patients if the nodule is immediately subpleural. When you withdraw the needle slowly, you will have blood tracking uh, towards the pleura, acting as a sealant, as if you are injecting blood or gel or saline, and that usually reduces the risk of an exit pneumothorax. But what I do the most now in every patient is a rapid rollover. So I've biopsied this, and as soon as it's done, you turn the patient 180 degrees, such as the puncture site is down. This should be done in 10 to 15 seconds. And usually uh, the pressure here, the gravity uh, uh, prevents or seals the tract and prevents the exit pneumothorax. If a pneumothorax does occur, then manage it. Here's a 53-year-old subpleural nodule. I put it in. There was an entry pneumothorax, but it was because of air from outside. And so I aspirated the air and then finished the biopsy, which is what you should do. But it didn't work in this patient because the pneumothorax here that occurred was because of uh, a leak from the lung itself. And though I tried aspirating, it didn't work. So then I put a catheter inside and then, you know, the, the pneumothorax was tackled and I finished the biopsy because that's what the patient has come for. Pain management is important. And very often as radiologists, we just go ahead, do the biopsy. Even if the patient is screaming, we just, you know, don't take cognizance of that. And whenever I'm doing second biopsies, very often the patient is petrified because of the pain that they had during the first procedure. And it's it's quite easy to manage pain, preventing pain, preventing um or managing pain if it occurs during the procedure. So for prevention, obviously use liberal local anesthesia, lignocaine in the skin. So lungs uh, inject lignocaine at the pleural extra pleural interface just on the liver capsule. Um, if you're going to go through the diaphragmatic crust, then use local anesthesia at the point where you're traversing the diaphragmatic crust, etc. And if the patient is very anxious, or gets, um, uh, you know, gets pain, which is significant during the, the procedure, then just sedate, which means you do need an anesthetist or somebody well-versed with intravenous sedation to be with you. Do that for all bone biopsies, irrespective, and if the patient is anxious. Then we need to know tips and tricks for hitting the target. So the best thing is if you're, if you're new, you're a resident, you're starting out and start with larger lesions. And as you gain confidence, move into smaller ones. So you start with a seven centimeter, then go to a five centimeter, then a two centimeter, then an eight millimeter. And these days we do three and four millimeter nodules, but that's after 30 years of doing all of this. But you can, you know, it shouldn't take more than three, four, five years uh, to get the expertise and experience required to do these. Use the shortest route possible. And you'll have people saying that, you know, you should do it such that the puncture site is always, site is always below the left atrium or down. Don't do all that. Just use the shortest route possible as here. And in this patient, the decubitus, the, the, the lateral is the shortest. So put the patient in the uh, uh, contralateral decubitus position and then go ahead and do it. Or here, you have a masticator space lesion. If you know the anatomy, you would know that the simplest is to go straight in because really there is no abnormal, ve no vessel or anything dangerous that comes in the way. And then you can safely biopsy this. If your gantry can be angulated, use that. So here's a rib coming in front of the nodule in the prone position. Five degrees gantry angulation and you've cleared a path here and then you can go ahead and biopsy this. 
choose the correct position for the patient. So here's a patient who has an adrenal nodule. Now you could do this in the prone position, but in this patient, the lung was coming in the way. So I chose to use the ipsilateral decubitus. So that splints the diaphragm, which means that you're not going through lung. And then it becomes quite easy to penetrate the nodule and then do the biopsy. So remember that for adrenal nodules, if the, if the prone position uh, still doesn't help, you can use the ipsilateral decubitus. For lungs, by and large, you would do the contralateral decubitus. Use intravenous contrast liberally. So here's a 64-year-old man has a mass in the uncinate process. They've asked me to biopsy this. I'm worried about the SMA here. So here I'm going transgastric first, then I'm at the edge of the pancreatic head. I've given contrast, so now I know where the SMA is. I've gone further in, but now the contrast is gone. So when I withdraw the needle a little bit, then deploy the gun, I've given a second round of contrast, again, to make sure that I'm not penetrating any abnormal vessel and I'm not here and then you can safely biopsy this. The salinoma technique helps in the same way. This is a 14-year-old with fever and non-necrotic adenopathy. You can see the lymph node 34 millimeters long. Here it is, the, the needle going in. The first thing is to position it just next to the intervertebral foramen uh, where you have this clear space going through and then inject about 7-8 cc of lignocaine. You can see a little air that's gone in through the foramen and you've created a little space here. Advance the needle a little more and then inject about 10 to 15 cc of saline mixed with a little bit of lignocaine. So now you've got this good space created <clears throat> and you can go in penetrate the uh, lymph node and then biopsy it, being extra pleural all the time. And hydrodissection can be similarly used for anterior lesions, especially if you're going parasternal to keep the um, <clears throat> uh, mammary artery out of the way, etc. Don't be scared to go transorgan. So here are different prevascular space lesions and I've gone transsternal and that's an easy thing to do because the sternum is a very thin bone. Here is a pancreatic biopsy going transhepatic. Here is a presacral biopsy where I've gone transsacral. So you can experiment. It's fine to go transosseous, transorgan. And transosseous is perhaps the safest and the simplest thing to do. One additional tip is to use the blunt tip. So here's a patient who has a pancreatic head mass, two negative biopsies, too many vessels here. The window between vessels is at best five millimeters. What do you do? If you look at your barred set, this is the 18 gauge, but it's true for the 20. It comes with this blunt tip <clears throat> apart from the sharp uh, stillet. And so what you can do is exchange the sharp stillet for the blunt tip, and I'll show you how. So here it is. I've, you need the sharp stillet to penetrate the skin and the abdominal wall. Here now I have exchanged this with the blunt tip. The blunt tip will not penetrate vessel. It slides past the vessel. You think it's penetrating, but it's not. So I've slid past the vessel. I've given contrast to now understand the anatomy here. I know there's a small window here. So I've managed to, to get the needle up to here. But it's a blunt tip. So it again just passes past the vessels. It doesn't penetrate them. But it does penetrate the surface of the tumor. Then I exchange the blunt tip for the sharp stillet, penetrate it a little more in, and then I've deployed the gun along with another round of IV contrast to biopsy this lesion. So get, get used to using the blunt tip if you want to bypass bowel, bypass vessels, especially in the abdominal cavity when you're biopsying mesenteric or pancreatic lesions then obviously you need to get an answer. You've done all of this and imagine getting a, a negative report after doing, after make, taking so much of an effort. So make sure you always biopsy and always use a gun cannula technique. Do not split samples. You know, so often the patients and 
relatives will say, uh, or the doctors may say, you know, send one sample to that pathologist, send another sample to pathologist B, their idea being that somehow we will get one definite answer. That doesn't work. All samples to one pathologist, and then they can take the slides and block for a second opinion. In India and TB endemic countries always take material for microbiology in patients who are not known malignancies and are, you know, have come for the first time and follow up your reports because sometimes the pathologist and the microbiologist, obviously, you know, they're not even talking to each other. And it does happen that your microbiology is positive, but the pathologist gives a result saying, you know, inadequate sample, no diagnosis. And then the patients are confused, not sure. Doctors are saying, oh, this was a useless biopsy report without knowing that the PCR has come positive. So make sure you have somebody in the team or at the center in the hospital following up these reports. So you can then tell people, yes, I've got an answer. And if you consistently tell your referring doctors that you're getting answers and sending them, you know, they will send more work to you as well. So here's how to use the gun cannula or the coaxial technique. That's the 20 gauge cook here. That's the cannula with the stillet inside. Once, um, and you know, this is with, without the stillet. So if you put it inside the patient, um, then you would remove the stillet, exchange it, and then put the gun inside. And you know, when the cannula stays inside, you can take as many cores as you want. For bone biopsies, use the 11 gauge diamond tip needle or the jamshidis to penetrate. You need a hammer sometimes to do that. And then use a 16 or 18 gauge uh, gun through this to take cores. And even if it's sclerotic bone, you should be able to get some cores with this. And this is always better than just using a jamshidi because then you have to keep going in and out, in and out multiple times using the gun and in fact the 14 gauge i find these days is really really sharp and goes through bone as well and gives you an answer so just to summarize that part coaxial technique single puncture use these guns 10 to 20 millimeter throws depending on the situation and use the largest gun you can safely use so the idea with this lecture was to talk about protecting yourself protecting the patient hitting the target and getting answers a lot of the stuff I do is up at ctbiopsy.com where I post a case every, you know, seven to 10 days. So you can, or not, about 10 to 15 days now. And you can subscribe to that. And thank you so much for listening to me. Take care.